So it's uh, all for play for still. I think so. Do you want to bet against us? Hello, Aston Villa fans, and welcome to For the Love of Paul McGrath podcast. And we, with breaking news, and you'd swear we planned this, myself and Chris, because uh, we were emailing back and forth, and he happened to say, yeah, I think I think 2.30 tomorrow would, would, would suit. And then almost bang on 2.30 for Brits Romano comes out with a here we go. Uh, that Morgan Rogers, uh, the fee and the, the payment plan, or whatever you want to call it, has been agreed between Aston Villa and Middlesbrough for the transfer of uh, Morgan Rogers, And who better to talk to than a Borough fan and to Chris from Boropolis. Chris, how are you doing? Yes, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, as you say, perfect timing, really. And I promise I didn't have any sort of inside info on this. It just so happens that we've been, well, I mean, lucky on your side, not so lucky on our side. Yeah. Uh, that it's sort of been agreed when it has, really. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, look, you know, I think this one from the outset, there has been a lot of negotiations. And you know what? We'll talk about that in a moment because I like when a team negotiates in a transfer fee. And, and you know, I think that it is the proper, it was the way it used to be done before, uh, you know, the teams that have to go in multiple times with bids. And in a way, I'm kind of happy that, uh, that, that something like that has happened. But John Percy has even doubled on it just now, saying that AVFC are poised to complete the signing of Middlesbrough forward. Morgan Rogers for a deal worth up to 15 million. Understand the fee is an initial 10 million pounds with a further 5 million in add ons. And the D agreed earlier this afternoon meets the asking price that Burrow were seeking. Looks like he's going to travel to for medicals, uh, medicals today, tomorrow, and should be unveiled before the start of the, uh, of the transfer window. All in all, Chris, I suppose fair fee, fair fee, 15 million. Yeah, yeah, I think it was key that we got that 10. Um, promised really before the add-ons and I think a lot of the frustration yesterday when that uh, report from John Percy come out was that it was only going to be 7.5 which obviously got rejected mm. and I think Middlesbrough there were some reports that we were looking for around 12 up front but I, I always thought after yesterday if they could get to that 10 mark where they were guaranteed that money then it would get the deal done. Uh, I, I think overall obviously we'll We'll, we'll get more in depth into it and how he's performed this season and sort of from a Middlesbrough fans perspective the interest as a whole comes somewhat of a shock and I think to get to a a fee where you could potentially earn 15 million for a player that's been at a club for six months is I mean I'm still a little bit in shock to be honest yeah and I think I think that's fair as well like a lot of Aston Villa fans are are uh, I think it's fair to say I'm not one of them but a lot of Aston Villa fans are on the fence with regards to signing like this he went for one million during the summer um city are the ones who are rubbing their hands with glee at this because apparently they've got a a 20% sell-on clause or whatever it is there so like obviously they're they're uh, hoping that Middlesbrough were playing hardball on this one um and then obviously as you say he's been somebody who's come into the middle this Middlesbrough side been coached by a very good coach of Michael Carrick when I Emery sees him up close in the FA Cup and probably decide no I I there's obviously extenuating circumstances. This isn't just a one game uh, prediction. I think from a Nuna Emery side of things, obviously um, Rogers was under the tutelage of Mark Harrison, who's our academy uh, is, is our, ahead of our academy at the moment. He knows him inside out from his West Brom days, but um, Villa nearly signed Mark Roger, uh, uh, Morgan Rogers when, um, when Jack Grealish was going to Man City, he was, was uh, potentially part of the deal. So it's somebody they've long held an interest in, but as you say, for Middlesbrough fans, it's pretty much a win-win for them getting f whatever nine million, I suppose, realistically up front in profit, um, and and then onwards. But talk to us a small little bit about talk to us a small little bit about I suppose about him and about what you've seen of him in the short time he's been with the club. Yeah, it's it's obviously interesting that you mentioned the sort of previous interest and the previous connections with with Morgan Rogers, but from a Middlesbrough fans' perspective. He come into the club with not a great deal of expectation. Obviously, he'd had that loan spell with Blackpool, and in fairness to him, look, Blackpool were sort of whipping boys in the championship last mm. season, so I don't think he was expected to do too much in a team which 
didn't have a lot of possession, but he come in in the summer for, as you say, a minimal fee between one and one and a half million. And he was sort of seen early on in the season as the potential replacement for Tuba Akpom in that number 10 role, the sort of withdrawn striker, I guess. And it was a big gamble, don't get me wrong. Obviously, a player that we sold for probably a similar fee, if not a, a little bit more than what we're going to sell Morgan Rogers to Aston Villa for. Tuba Akpom had scored nearly 30 goals last season. So, big expectation. Um as a re- in terms of a replacement, but Rogers has come in and through no fault of his own really early on this season was playing really a number nine role and it just didn't suit his game at all. And I think that sort of, you, you've probably seen it yourself with players that come in and they, they might start off fairly slowly, but you can tell they show glimpses and you think, you know what, there's definitely a player in there. I'm not ready to give up on him just yet. And that was the case with Rogers really. Um, Obviously, top scorer in the Carabao Cup, that competition for him this season has been really important and it's where half of his goal contributions has come from and and probably where a lot of the sort of media attention, of course, Aston Villa won't just sign more based off media attention, but where uh, these sort of bigger numbers, goals and assists have, have come from in that competition. So, yeah, he, he's come back into the team recently and... His form through the Carabao Cup really has got him back into the the league side, and yeah, it's still interesting because I think obviously now he's no longer going to be our player, and recently his form has got him into the team. But there's been certain parts throughout this season where Morgan Rogers, and we've had a lot of injury problems this season. But you would have said if we had all options available that Morgan Rogers wasn't even necessarily guaranteed to be a starter in our front line. And yes, admittedly, he's, his form's turned around recently and he, he has showed very impressive glimpses. But yes, yeah, still some of... I think there's definitely a player there. He's shown you know, a, a lot of times now in fairness in different matches that he can he can just pick something out of a hat, really. He is that type of, he might go missing for 60 minutes in a game and then produce an assist and that's his contribution. But yeah, it's it, it's still interesting that Unai Emery is so adamant that he wants him and that, you know, he, it's proven to be his top target and obviously now it looks like you'll get that over the line. But I think Middlesbrough fans are still happy with this deal and I think that's an interesting perspective for Villa fans to look at because it's not often where a player that's been at your club six months and then you know has has done a lot of good things but Middlesbrough fans are almost I don't want to say happy to see him go but content with the deal and sort of but- sending him on with best wishes. Uh, best wishes. Yeah, but without putting words in your mouth, I suppose it's a case of, well, if we have to lose any one of our, our front four, probably he's the one that we don't really mind losing. Uh, that's probably the way that they've... That, that's my view of it when I, don't, when I look at Middlesbrough. Yes, I'm one of those people who who is voyeuristic on Middlesbrough forums and all other teams' forums, specifically when we're uh, when we're trying to sign players and and, and look through Twitter at their at their fan accounts too. Um, w- would it be fair to say, or I suppose once again, it's hard to ask somebody this very specific question after only six months or eight months of seeing the player, but would it be fair to say that that systemically maybe he did he, he like Carrick's system suited other suited players more? Um, than they suited him or does Carrick play a system whereby the front three are given a ton of freedom whereby if you're expressive you can express yourself because the reason I ask that is like Unai Emery is probably the the system manager at the moment like he is fantastic at, 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 and his system works and, and he needs people to be able to play any system and the one thing one reason I ask it is because Morgan Rogers um, his defensive uh, contribution on the field is at, like you can see it when he plays out in that 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 wide left situation or even as a 10 like even when you guys play Chelsea in the in the league cup uh, second second leg um his job was to 
mark Casado. It wasn't to be a, a number nine like striker. His job was just to sit on Casado for the whole game, and it didn't work. And look, the team, like you know, the score was what it was. But from from a from a Michael Carrick point of view, I suppose is he kind of systemic in his nature with regards to how he sets up his team, and is it something that maybe Morgan Rogers was that one of the reasons why he kind of maybe struggled to 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 nail down a, a place during the course of the season? Uh, I think Michael Carrick's very sort of set in his ways and only really, funnily enough, when we played Aston Villa and in the first leg against Chelsea, we've really been a little bit more flexible formation-wise and, and tactically. And, and obviously, Rogers played in the Villa game. He was suspended for the Chelsea game. But typically, um, Michael Carrick will line up with a 4-2-3-1 and the left side of the three behind the striker sort of inverts and becomes really sort of a double mm. 10, has a little bit of a free roll. And I think Morgan Rogers, as you say, coming in off that left or as the 10, that is his best position when he is able to have that freedom. And I, I think of a specific example against Coventry this season. To have that freedom with Morgan Rogers, uh, I remember he, he come and picked the ball up on the edge of our box Cruyff turned away from a Coventry player and literally ran with the ball and got to the opposition's penalty area. And I think he passed it off and the, the move broke down. But that is one of his strengths. His ball carrying ability is something, even when he was playing as a number nine and didn't look as convincing as perhaps everyone hoped he might, that was one of his standout attributes. And I think, as I say, yeah, with the system that, that we've been playing this season, his best form and his best football has come when he's had that little bit more freedom, either coming in off the left or that sort of, sort of more natural number ten position. Mm. And and you know I'm going to pop, I'm going to try and pop up some some slides I've done on Morgan Rogers here previously. Um, so you'll just see that they will pop up here on the screen. Just to reference a couple of pieces here that we have in him, you know, putting him in comparison with the likes of Ollie Watkins in our in our team at the moment. Um, we can see here I've got him marked here as a well. Don't mind the foot here left. Uh, I put it in his left foot there by mistake <laughs> because I just never changed the previous slide that I had. So please don't kill me on that one, everybody. Um, I don't know you noticed it as I popped up the slides the last time I did something on Morgan Rogers. But what you can see here from, from my point of view when I talk about him here is that, you know, what you've mentioned here is a player who potentially doesn't take an awful lot of shots. And what we can see here statistically is he doesn't take them. Now, I, the, his conversion rate is quite good as well, but he works hard by the, by the look of his numbers. Does that pop out on the screen as well when you watched him as much as you have? Uh, you know, his ball recoveries, his ability, you mentioned there about shot creating actions, his ability to kind of make something happen um, and be efficient in that area. Does Does that kind of jump off the screen, I suppose, more so in a defensive point of view? Yeah, I, I think obviously with the stats that you've got on the screen there, it's something that obviously there is underlying data. I think on the eye test, which is something that on, on my uh, podcast we feel very strongly about. Yeah, I think it's it's not sort of attributes that I'd really look at Morgan Rogers and think, well, yeah, that side of his game is a is a real strength. Look, he's he's very tenacious. As I say, he likes to get involved. But then in other games, he will sort of go missing for periods, 20, 30 minutes sometimes, and then pop up with an attacking contribution. But, you know, his, his work rate is good. Um, but as I say, it, it, to be honest, it shocked me a little bit looking at them stats as to, as to how sort of positive they are really in terms of his defensive attributes as well. Mm. And this is these are his these are his uh, attributes up against left sided midfielders are uh, what I would say more more winger type uh, midfielders that we have the Leon Bailey's the Zaniolos the 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 Diabies here you know when we look at goal creating actions and shot creating actions uh, he's on target percentage and stuff like this when you look at them all I suppose up against those other players the green line here is is Morgan Rogers we can see here that he. You know, if, even though he's in the championship, and yes, you can talk about maybe the the, the the strength of opposition, so on and so forth, but the economical nature of how he plays jumps off the screen here, given that he's been in and out of the team. And the, going back to the question I asked you about uh, about system type players, with the inside knowledge we have of 
Um, number one, Aaron Danks is now managing him. And let's be honest, we have his phone number from, from last year <laughs> at Aston Villa. I'm sure it was a very easy conversation to figure out what he's like there. And then secondly, with, with Mark Harrison, uh, knowing this guy from, uh, you know, just before he made that £6 million move to, uh, to to Man City as a teenager. So I think the, the underlying data is something that we... Um, that we should look at with regards to Morgan Rogers. But as you said, you always you can never ever dispel the eye test as well because the eye test is what 99.9% of fans are going to judge a player on. We have it here at Aston Villa whereby sometimes Ali Watkins doesn't score for four or five games in a row and all of a sudden there's a conversation about should he be out of the team because, you know, if you're an attacker, the numbers people want to see are goals and assists. But I suppose realistically, it's it's important to look at some of these numbers, numbers too as well. Um, Another little quick one, I suppose, on, on Morgan Rogers. The uh, temperament side of things, I suppose, with regards, and again, it's very difficult to ask these questions for somebody who's been there six six months. Everything we kind of hear about him from, you know, his time at Man City, his time at Lincoln specifically when he, when he played uh, some really good football and his time in Blackpool is that he's a learner, he's a, he's a sponge for information, that he's just an all-around kind of good guy in the dressing room. He's not a prima donna for somebody who, as I said, was sold sold for six million at a, a, a as as a as a teenager. Is that something that's true? I suppose is what I'm asking. Or has there been anything really that would have denoted he might be a big time Charlie when, uh, during his time at uh, at Middlesbrough? Yeah, as you say, it's been a a short spell really. But I guess some hmm. of the surprise comes with the fact that early on in his Middlesbrough career, Morgan Rogers did interviews in pre season, and immediately all the Middlesbrough found, uh, fans found him very endearing. He spoke about sort of finally finding that permanent home. And as I say, that's part of the shock factor, really, because he's he's found his permanent home and now he's sort of returning to Mm. his previous home in terms of geographically. But Mm. yeah, um, by all accounts, all of the sort of media that he's done, he seems like a really good character. Um, struck up really good relationships with other Middlesbrough players by all accounts obviously you only get to see certain little pieces and bits and pieces here and there on social media and things like that but even in terms of the club media seems like a, a really nice lad that basically just wants to do well and, and play football and I think obviously with that um, Manchester City move that you talk about it's probably, you know, for him, I, I, the, there was reports that you maybe could tell me more about this as to whether he is actually a boyhood Villa fan. And don't know. He's from Hale's own anyway, but we don't, like, it's never been confirmed whether he's a Villa, whether he's Villa yeah, that... or, or West Brom. A lot of people in our chat have said that, like, their cousin or their brother or whatever, like, went to school with him and stuff like that. So um, he is in the Villa catchment area, but whether he's a Villa fan. Uh, is is still to be told. Yeah, yeah, but as I was saying, obviously, um, it's. I keep on saying shock to be honest, because as I say, he spoke so prominently about, you know, finding that permanent home, and he's he's really starting at the moment to find that form, and yeah, I, I think it's a testament to his character that listen. As soon as the first sort of report of interest come out, there was the obvious line of Morgan Rogers would be interested by the move. And why wouldn't he be? Aston Villa are a massive, massive football club in a great position in the Premier League. And especially if he is a Villa fan or a boyhood supporter, then even more so. But it's a testament to his character that he hasn't thrown his toys out the pram. As far as we're aware, there's been no written transfer request. He's kept his head down even after the first bid. He's played games since then and, and got on with it and not sulked where previously players in that kind of position have done so. So I think that's a big sort of shout out of the way that he's gone about this really. And, you know, in the end, he's got his move. And I don't think Middlesbrough fans would really sort of feel aggrieved. And as I said earlier, they'll wish him best going forward, really. Good, yeah, and, and and I think you know there's been a couple of Villa players that have have left it our blessing before, not too many, but a couple have left it our blessing before, um, you know as well, and more will do so afterwards. And I think look, from it's a win-win probably for everybody, and it's up now to Unai Emery. To Unai Emery has seen something in him, and the Villa scouting staff have seen something in him that can come in and fit in this, and that's why I was 
That's why I mentioned about systemic because there's going to be lots of chatter on, on Twitter about this being a potential waste of money and stuff like that. And I have no way to tell you whether this is going to be the, the signing that kicks us into the Champions League and, and reignites our form in front of goal. But, um, you know, hope springs eternal from that point of view. And the fact he's only 21 years of age is, uh, you know, he's moldable. It kind of, in a way, reminds me um, of, you know, when Dan Juma left Bournemouth to, to move to Villarreal. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of players would probably have said, oh, well, I could probably do better than, than Juma. And then all of a sudden he came in and during that 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 period of time, um, outplayed himself and probably played his best football ever for Villarreal and played in the Champions League. And uh, maybe there's yeah. something like this, you know, uh, Morgan Rogers' stature, his height, his, uh, his, his ability to carry the ball, as you mentioned. Actually, I've got a quick question on the carrying of the ball. Whenever I've watched him, he's a funny style of running. Am I right that like because it just seems funny to me? Like I don't know whether it's because he's a big guy and he's running, but would you would you consider him slow? I don't, but my my co-host thinks he's slow. <laughs> I, I, I certainly wouldn't consider him slow. Um, I think he's one of those players where actually he's probably quicker when he's got the ball at his feet. Um, with his close control, mm. obviously his ball carrying that we've mentioned, I think sometimes it can be a little bit deceiving. But I certainly wouldn't sort of group Morgan Rogers into a category of being slow. I've seen plenty of slow players at Middlesbrough over the years, and he's certainly not one I'd say that's slow. Yeah, uh, and to be for me, he kind of runs like David, well, not exactly like David Ginla, but David Ginla in his pump used to run and he used to drag his feet behind him. And I think it's like Morgan Rogers does that. And Ginola wasn't slow, but when you looked at him, he just, he looked like he was running differently to everybody else in the field. And I think that's what it is. But um, look, put it this way. If he picks the ball up in the middle of the center circle, like he did against Coventry, he does his Cruyff turn and Bur Lungbuster through the center because Villa need options who are powerful runners that can, you can carry the ball forward. And we do need those options to be able to break down the low block, to be able to run past it. So that's an interesting piece. Lastly, I know you mentioned that, that game against Coventry, but if you were to sum up Morgan Rogers' strengths, uh, his one biggest strength, that, or sorry, his two biggest strengths, because you're probably going to go with his ball-carrying ability. His two biggest strengths, what should Villa be looking out for? Yeah, I think you sort of took the one, so I'll give you another one. His ball-carrying, <laughs> without doubt, is, is his main strength from what I've seen of him this season. And I, I, I think... In the championship, what tends to get these players moves is goal contributions. And he's got 16 goal contributions this season. And for a player that has predominantly played off the left or as a 10, I think just it, it's hard to sort of put a stat on it or, or, or quantify it. But I, I think just those those moments in games where, as you say, you might be playing against a low block, a uh, prime example the last, well, before Chelsea, the last game we played was against Rotherham. And we went 1-0 down. And just one of those games where you just almost accept defeat. Bottom of the league, Rotherham, you're expecting to be go home disappointed. And then the ball is bouncing around on the edge of the box. And he back heels one that no, probably no one else on the pitch could have done. Back heels one through to Marcus Force and we get the equaliser. And I think that, that little moment of magic breaking down a... A low block, as you say, would probably, as well as his ball carrying, be the sort of standout thing that I've noticed from. More oh, oh, we lost Chris and he came back again. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you're saying he's kind of his unpredictability, um, along with his, uh, well, uh, so. And unpredictability seems to be a bad thing nowadays, which I, I, I don't think it is. There's two different types of unpredictability. There's confident unpredictability and there's people who just do things out wildly for the sake of it. And from watching him, I would agree with you as well. He will, he'll get, he'll, he'll do something. Like he's fl a flair, I suppose, more so than, than unpredictability. Yeah, he has yeah, this kind of flair yeah. about it. Like when he strikes the ball, the ball stays hit. When he strikes it yeah. as well, you know, I've I found out he, he's he's quite a good strike ball striker. Whether it's uh, putting a bend on it, like we've seen some of his goals, just whipped in the top corner. His goal against Chelsea as well, you know, it was a lower type shot. Pe Petrovic tries to get to that a big guy, he can't get to it. It's been bent perfectly into the corner, uh, and he's had some situations like that where he can pull pull that bit of flair out of out of nowhere. And I think look, Villa need that, and you need that in the Premier League as well. So uh, fingers crossed, he does it more and more often for Aston Villa. And uh, and we get to see it very very soon. 
Um, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. As I say, it's where we had this plan. Well, we did have a plan, but we didn't have any inside information that he, Morgan Rogers was going to be all but a Villa player, um, provided he doesn't fail any 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 medicals um, at this time. But I thank you so much for your time, Chris. Wish you all the best for the rest of the season with Middlesbrough. Um, it, it's I, I wish I hope Finn Azaz scores like forty goals for you for the rest of the season. He's a bit of a favourite here. Obviously, being an Irish under twenty one international, yeah. we're pushing for him to be uh, in the full full setup as well. And you know, you guys have taken good care of Aaron Aaron Ramsey and and Cameron Archer, two previous villains of ours. So um, I wish. Yeah, you I was, ju I was just going to say, I hope the fact that we uh, have rejected a few bids hasn't sort of soured the relationship, <laughs> and Aaron Danks is still able to pick up the phone and sort of take Villa's top young players. Um, yeah. next season and going forward because as you say there's been some good ones and obviously hopefully Azaz lives up to those other Aston Villa loans that we've had as well Absolutely. Well, the way things are going, we mightn't have any young players too far to farm out if <laughs> rumors that we believe that the amount that we're, we're we're selling people. Um, but I jest in that. I and just for anybody, I'm looking at the comments as well. I don't think JJ is going anywhere between now and now and Thursday. So don't worry about that. He's injured noon. I said he doesn't want he doesn't want to sell him anyway. Um, I just think it was a flyer that was thrown out there. Plus, Almiron isn't leaving Newcastle, so therefore, uh, they don't have the money to purchase him anyway. And Bayern Munich aren't stumping up 60 million. You know, he's not Harry Kane. So uh, I'm resting easy on the JJ Ramsey side of things here at the moment. Uh, but once again, Chris, thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much, thank everybody you. else, for watching. We will be back later on with a team sheet tantrum before the uh, the Newcastle game. And as always, we'll be back right on the final whistle with a post-match podcast as well. But Chris, once again, thank you so much. Wish you, wish you so much uh, luck, for, luck and well-being for the rest of the season. And hopefully you guys get promoted because proper football club. I love regional football clubs. Um, and I think there should be more of them in the Premier League. Get that, like, relegate all the London teams and get <laughs> regional football teams in there. That's what I'm looking for because uh, yeah, it's a more and, passionate uh, fan base. And hopefully you you get a result against uh, Newcastle tonight. That would go down well on Middlesbrough. I think so. I was going to say that make you smile as well, as much as it would make <laughs> me smile. Excellent. Well, thank you so much and thanks, everybody. We'll see you later. Stay safe, stay healthy. And all that's left to say is up the villa. Yeah.